Good morning. So yes, my name is West Hart. It is pronounced West. I have been asked this question um, many times in my life. I am the UX Director of Platform for Wargaming. Prior to that, I was an experienced designer at Riot Games. I worked on League of Legends for many years. I also worked on Riot's platform. And my specialty was in social systems and player behavior. Now, I figured the best way for us to jump into the topic, and I like to jump into the topic, is to ask you a few questions. You don't have to answer aloud, but I want to ask you, first of all, have you ever gotten excited about a usable experience? Exactly. Have you ever called up a friend and said, hey, have you downloaded that new app? Have you played that new game? It's so consistent. Have you ever answered the question, how was your vacation, by saying, simple? No. Who does this? This isn't how people talk about their experiences, right? I mean, where's the emotion? Where's the story? Something must have happened, even if it was bad. This isn't how people really talk about experience. However, this is how many people talk about user experience. And I think that's where many people go wrong. You see, user experiences always involve emotion. That's because users are humans. Humans are emotional creatures. We essentially have feelings about everything that we interact with. Emotions have a heavy influence on us, including how we learn things. In fact, it's less things that we remember, right, when we learn them, when we learn about them, when we experience them, and it's more of how things made us feel, especially when there's a dramatic change of some sort. So when you have an experience and the emotional needle is moved one way or the other, you tend to remember it better. Another way to think of it is that the stronger the emotion, the greater the retention, more or less. And so if something is dramatic, we tend to remember it. And our experiences can evoke a lot of emotions, because experiences are a series of interactions. And since we react to our interactions, there's going to be a number of things that you feel on any given experience. Now, if that experience is memorable, one emotion will likely stand out. So in this example here, it's commonly referred to as an acquisition funnel. I cannot tell you how much I hate that term. It makes it so inhuman. But OK, acquisition funnel, something in the gaming industry many of us know of. So we have a player who sees an ad, says, cool, that game seems interesting go to the website, tries to download the game, but then they have a problem. They have a lot of problems. Something's wrong with the website. It takes them a long time to download the game. Now, they may eventually play. They may actually have a good time, but the experience is colored by that interaction. We cannot help it. If an interaction you have in an experience is negative, it will color in some way the whole experience. If it's really strong, it's setting the tone for the experience. And so we must be concerned with every interaction that a player has, because it sets the tone. It starts to shape their perception. A real, well, more or less real life example, or way of thinking of this scenario is, imagine, imagine you hear about a band. And you say, OK, cool, I'm going to go see this band. You go to the venue, you stand in line, you're getting excited with everybody else, you get your ticket, and just as you're about to walk through the door, boom, doorman elbows you right in the face. It won't matter how good the band plays. You won't forget the elbow, right? We can't elbow players in the face. I'm sure everyone here will agree. Unless that's the only thing you can do to be memorable, yes, that will probably work. But no, we don't want to elbow players in the face. And it may seem extreme, 
but we need to consider every interaction that a person has with the things that we create because it starts to shape how they think about us. And emotional reactions can be fast and they can be final. Google did a study a few years ago. We wanted to find out how quickly will someone have an opinion about a website. As fast as 17 milliseconds. 17 milliseconds. It's less than half a second, and they have judged you, right? Whatever website you made, they've seen it, done. They haven't even begun to get conscious of the fact that they have an opinion at that point, I'm sure. But it's really, really fast. So in that example that I showed you, where someone may be discovering your game and downloading your game from your website, that's a crucial moment, isn't it? Right? Their reaction in that moment could make or break the relationship that they have with your game. So we really need to be careful about that. And the finality statistic is that 88% of people that have a bad experience will never come back. 12% might give you another chance. 88% of people just don't have the time. If the experience is bad, they're done. And so, as emotional creatures, creating things for other emotional creatures, we need to be concerned about the emotions they have across the whole experience, all the interactions that they have. And with a modern game, they have a lot. You see, games are really just the heart of a complex system. There are many ways that players interact with your game that don't involve play. So players may go to a website, read news. They may be sharing things about the game with their friends over social media. They may go to live events, right, or watch streams or videos. All of these things are ways that players interact with the game. And though we might think of them as separate and distinct experiences, to players, it all means game. All of these things shape their perception of the game. And so, this is hard for us, right? It's hard enough getting the game right, but we've got to be concerned about the whole system because that's where the experience happens. From the moment they hear about it, all the way through to talking about the, the game with their friends, all of these things are the experience. And so it's important that we consider the whole system, every interaction in that system, every feeling that it causes. We have to make sure the whole experience is right, and the experience is right when the whole system is focused on a feeling worth repeating. I'll say it again. The whole system needs to be focused on a feeling worth repeating. And isn't that what we want? Isn't that what you want? With anything you interact with, it could be your phone, it could be a game, you want to come back to something that feels good. This, this is necessary as humans. Right? This is where loyalty comes from. Right? You go back to those things that feel good. It could be safety. We stay with groups of people that make us feel good about ourselves. We keep going back to those things. And as those of us who are creating things for others, this is what we want. This is how fans are made. Right? And not just to do it for fans, but to do it because this is what we would want for ourselves. We want to come back to things that produce a feeling worth repeating. You with me so far? Okay, I know it's early. I had to wait on my coffee a little bit, so I understand if it takes a little bit. But a natural question we have at this point is, what do we do? What do we do when it was hard enough to get the game right? We'll assume for our conversation we got the game right. So what do we do to try and help the whole system produce a feeling worth repeating? Well, what I like to do for most of the remainder of the talk is show you how. And what we're going to use are these. You can think of this as a process. We're going to use it as a process, but some of these strategies one needs to employ no matter what. We're going to step through them 
So I'll give you a moment to take a look at the list, but we will look at them individually. And we're going to apply them right now on a game called Final Night. Final Night is more or less, first of all, it's not real. <laughs> Final Night, more or less, is World of Warcraft meets Battle Royale. Yes, you and allies will get together. You will conquer kingdoms. But in the end, only one will rule. This may be the most toxic game ever created. I didn't think about that until I wrote the talk because I can see from a player behavior perspective that it's going to be trolling day and night. But we're going to assume that this was a good idea. We need an example, so we'll step through. But this is what our company, I didn't make up a name for the company, we'll consider it just ours. Our company says, yes, this is something we're interested in. So, first thing we want to do is understand deeply. We need to do our homework. It is one thing to make a game, but remember, we're not making the game for ourselves. We need to understand the space. We need to create things to help us see the shape of the space. And through this research, the most important question that we need to answer is why? Why are we going to do this? Why should we do this? We can make anything we want, but why? We need a good reason. So as you're doing research on this space, well, one of the things you need to research is yourselves. Who are we? What do we care about as a company, as a team? What do we value? Anything that humans create for other people are things that are felt. You need to put your own feelings into it. If you're not paying attention, one, you may produce something that is an unfeeling thing, which you don't want, or at least your audience won't want, because anything that's unfeeling they know is uncaring, and they won't want to use that thing. But also, in order to get the best out of yourselves and your team, really consider what you care about, what you value, what you stand for. Because this will resonate with your audience when you reach the right audience. And who is that audience? What games do they play? Have they played? What's happening in the industry? Where is it going? So this is all research that you need to do, and you need to collect it and put it in a form where it's easy for everyone else you work with to see the insights. Not everyone's going to want to read all the research. It can be a lot of work to understand the full space. So distill it. Capture the, the key insights and share it with your team. But above all, focus on the people. The people who are making it, the people who will be playing it, they're crucial. Because if you don't understand who you're making it for, then it will never really resonate. So great. So we're going to do our research. And our team decided, yes, great. We're going to be smart. We're uh, we've thought about it, and we think this is the right game for us to make. We've made similar games. We love these kinds of games. Maybe we can do something new with it. There's a fresh spin. So for us, that is the why. We know that audience. Great. We're starting to get a bit of alignment. Now, so we've actually at this point said, yep, great. First part of our plan. Now, to get alignment, you need a North Star. You need to say, this is what we're going for. So keep in mind, emotion will be the key. We need to target an emotion that will ultimately align all the teams, the whole system. One emotion is plenty to start with. It's hard enough determining one. So how do you do it? What's your game about? What is the game about? What's the point? Right? What is the emotional promise of a game like Final Night, where only one will rule? Right? We would need to think about that. Every team will say, what is it that ultimately we're saying is the emotional outcome of being successful at this game? And distill that down into something that's easy to remember. It can just be a single word. For our, our game, we decided powerful. Only one will rule. Only one, yeah. If you're that one, it's going to feel really good. And you know you had to work hard to get there because that's the basis of the game. So yes, powerful is what we're going to say for the sake of this particular exercise is the emotion that we're going to go for. Now this next part is actually one of my favorites. 
You need to ratify the rules. The word powerful or any emotion that you target is going to have different interpretations. Each one of us will think of it differently, and that's, that's fine, but what we need are guardrails. We need something that helps us say no. You may think of them as principles. That's perfectly fine. What we want are some rules that everyone can follow because we need to be free. And I emphasize that word. We need to be free as teams, as individuals, to make the best decision we can for our context while still being aligned to the goal. If we're working on a big system, people working on websites and mobile apps, marketing material, all of these things, Right? need to be going towards a goal. So if we have some rules that help us make decisions, some razors, then we're going to be better equipped to do it. Then we'll know that even if it turns out it wasn't the right thing, we were right in choosing that direction because it followed the rules. So how do you distill from the emotion the rules? Well, you're more equipped to do it than you may realize. At first, you're human. Simply think like a human. For the Diamond Dogs album, David Bowie used an approach that I slightly modified. Um, you're going to hear me talk a lot about music, because music is basically what has shaped my whole perspective on user experience design. But what Bowie did, and I hear Alicia, Alicia Keys does the same thing, is before they wrote a song, they would take the emotion that they were thinking about, and they would write out a number of paragraphs on that emotion. And then they would pick apart the themes from it. Any one of us can do that, right? And this is the kind of thing, these are all the tools you really need to ratify rules. So if we're saying powerful, you can think about when you felt powerful. Actually, what can be really helpful is to think about when you weren't. When weren't you feeling powerful? When in your life have you been in a situation? Distill that down to what, what was it? What, what was that thing there that made you feel uncomfortable? Because this is really useful. We don't need any special tools. There's nothing more than being a human in order to figure that out. And it's also very useful to think about what are we afraid to forget if we don't do this thing that we keep talking about in our conversations? What are we afraid to forget? Write it down. It can be really useful. And each of these things you're going to put to the test. There's no guarantee that you'll know the right rules out the gate. Okay, humor me for a moment. I'm going to share something I wasn't originally going to include, and it's another music note. So a few years ago, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Nine Inch Nails, so I'm just going to call it out. But there was an interview that Trent Reznor, behind Nine Inch Nails, did on himself, you know, on, that he tacked onto the end of the record. And he said something I'm never going to forget. He writes rules for himself before he creates an album. And... He tries them out, and if they work, great. If they don't, they modify them, but that's, that's how he chooses the songs. That's how he makes a collection. Of all the things that we're making, it's really not terribly different, right? If we have a few rules, we can start to get something that feels like a whole. So for me, hopefully for you, actually, that's, that helps show you how these rules can be applied. But what about our game? Now, due to the limitations of time and space, we're not going to have too many rules. I'll keep it light for you. But we decided that there were two that we were going to focus on. So let's go back through thinking like a human. Powerful. All right? What is an opposite feeling of powerful? Powerless. OK. When have you felt powerless? One moment for people, I'll speak for myself, is often when I don't know what's going on when things are out of control, and I have no control over it. That's an excellent insight for a principle. So you're feeling out of control? Well, what would you need to feel powerful? To feel in control. The player should always feel in control. Another insight that we had, fictitiously, of course, with our team, is if you are the one who rules, if you're the final one, the final knight, you're going to stand out, right? You're going to be the, the, the king of the hill. You're going to look like a badass. Because you, know, you obviously had something different than everyone else. You're going to look stronger. So our team felt that 
We should call that out. There's opportunity there. Because if you are the one, or we want you to feel like the one, right? Because remember, it is about that, that feeling, that perception. Then we want to make sure that your personality is different. So our team says, okay, one night, one personality. We want to create things that help you as an individual feel, look different. It's how you perceive yourself to others and how we want others to perceive you. So great. Now we got two rules. See the system. It's very difficult to solve a problem you don't understand. It's really just a matter of luck. You can keep trying things until you get a solution that works. But really, to see a problem, you need to see the system. It's all systems. A game is a system. There's the ecosystem of apps that we use, that players interact with, with the game. All of these things are systems. You are a system as, a, um, as an organism. So we need to be able to see the system, and we need to be able to do this in a way that helps everyone on the team, in the company, see it too, so that we can actually have that worldview that helps us make really good decisions. And so one way to do this is to create a map of some kind, right, to see all the pieces. At Wargaming, on the platform team, we've actually found journey maps to be incredibly helpful because there's a lot of moving pieces, and we need to understand the relationships of those pieces. And what's really great, if you can see the worldview, by the way, did this get louder? Did the microphone move closer to my mouth? If it did, I'm sorry. We're good? Did I just mess it up too? Am I fiddling too much and making it worse? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So for the platform team, we found that in order to really see all the things that were involved in platform, right, we needed to create a map that could help us see it all. And it gave us a lot of insight that is driving a lot of the development that we're doing now because we could better see where the problems were. So one of the most important reasons for getting a worldview is because what you think is the problem might be a system, excuse me, a symptom within the system. You need the holistic perspective. So it's not dissimilar from, well, being a doctor, getting a diagnosis of some kind. You could look at the isolated problem, but it may just be a symptom that's caused by something else. So if you can see how all the pieces are working in concert, then you can make better decisions. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that hard. So a journey map, it's very cool looking, by the way. When you get a journey map that comes together, I will admit, it feels good, it feels like it's solid, but it should never be about the deliverables. It's just about getting what you need to answer the questions. So when I was at Riot, one thing that we used uh, to figure out an, how an experience would change and morph over the course of a whole year, I mean, time was a big consideration, we used Google Slides. We let anyone on the team jump in because, and, and create another slide if they needed, because the shapes were so simple, you needed no design skill. And it worked really, really well. We ended up printing it out, took up a whole wall, um, and then we could use Post-its, which anyone could use. Really, it could become very collaborative. But the point is, ultimately, see the system. Note the touch points. If you want to understand a player's experience, follow their paths. Where do they go? Where are we pointing them? Step through their shoes. Don't try and figure it out all in your head, because you can't possibly keep it all in your head. We've got too much going on as it is. So create a map. Identify the pain, and then and basically just make sure that everybody has an opportunity to chime in on it, work together, and then we collectively can develop this and then use it as a guide for where we want to go. So our team said yes. We need to see the system. And they said, yeah, OK, great, journey map. Journey map's going to do the job. So that's what we're going to focus on. Now, the last part of this, it might be fair to call it a process. I'm a little reluctant to, um, because some of these things, as I mentioned, we need to be doing throughout. Crafting with feedback is absolutely vital to creating something great for people. We're always going to be tempted to tick the box and say, yes, I made it. I made the thing. Yay. I can, I'm a designer. I've worked with developers. They're going to go make it. Fantastic. Well, that's not enough. 
It's not enough to make something that feels good. Right? You need to be getting feedback. And this is because no matter how good you are at what you do, the experiences that you've had shape your perception. And no one else has had your experiences. It doesn't matter how many games you've played. Let's say that you're into Dota, and you put thousands of hours into Dota. That's, that's awesome. No one else will see Dota the same way. They can't. No one else will see the game that you're developing the same way, or the website, or the mobile app, because you were one person. You are unique in that respect. Your experiences have given you a unique perspective. So you have to do things that help you see as other people. And it makes for a better product in general. And you can get there quicker. So you've got to get feedback. And you can do it in a lot of ways. And it doesn't have to be hard. One common mistake that I hear amongst UX designers is when we start talking about testing, they feel it has to be, some feel anyway, that it's got to be super formal. We have to wait to the end. And we're going to go into a lab. And yes, somehow, I don't know, maybe the perception is we have to put on our scientific lab coats. And yes, now we're going to be official and we're going to deliver the value. You better have done a lot I've gotten a lot of feedback along the way, because that's pretty late. One of the things that UX designers are here to help companies do is to build the right thing. And we can't do that if you've already built it. Don't wait to the end to get the feedback. We need to get it early. And you can do that simply by just grabbing someone next to you, throwing them at it. Don't guide them necessarily through it unless it's necessary, but let them try it out. You know, find ways to help them tell you what they're feeling, what they're seeing, and do this a lot. You need to relentlessly revise, because the craftsmanship is where the meaning ultimately comes from. The design by itself is meaningless. It's an idea. It's where we could go. But things change when you start crafting it. We learn. And a lot of the feeling is going to come through the code. It's going to come through the collection of the art with the interactions. This is where things really come about. And as experienced designers, do not let that go. Be a part of it. Work with everyone so that as we have that target, we have those rules, we're applying it throughout, but we can have better conversations because we've created a structure for ourselves to do it. And, and use whatever you can to work around your biases because you can't help it. It's just that simple. So our team wanted to establish some particular methods. I don't think you have to necessarily be very formal up front and say, yes, these are going to be our methods. But I have done this. I've been put on the spot a few times. I said, how are we going to get feedback? So our team says, we're going to do this. We're not just going to prototype a part of it. We're going to prototype all of it. A while back, I needed to figure out how social systems might work for a suite of apps that didn't exist yet. So how would you and others chat if you moved from one device to another? I just rigged it up in Axure. So I made it so that, yeah, hey, I can chat. Look at that. Yay, and I see two perspectives. It was a multi-perspective prototype so that I could actually see how multiple people would see an experience at the same time. Actually, it's, it's a pretty effective method, but the point really was to make sure that I'm getting the right perspective and I can see the system as it works, even in low fidelity, as opposed to just assuming that this part and this part are going to be fine. So our team says, yep, we're going, <laughs> we're going to go to Paradise City is what we're going to do right now. <laughs> I should have had theme music. Oh, I only realized at the end the musician should have had theme music. So, OK, we'll just let that be the, uh, the soundtrack to the, this next part of the talk. So our team also said, we're going to do cross-team demos. Right? We want to make sure that others can see what we're working on. And it doesn't have to just be, OK, well, here's a part of a game. right? It can also be, you know what, we've got a companion app. And what's it look like? So those people that really know the game well and you know the companion app, well, we can compare them so that we can start to see, does this make sense? Is this that vision? And boy, I think we're really getting into the strong part of the song, and I'm trying not to get distracted. Forgive me for distracting you with that. Um, another thing that one could do, uh, this our team decided to do, um, was ongoing page load test. 
Now, this may seem a little odd, but I was inspired to include this uh, um, a book um, that I was recently reading called Creative Selection. And it had to do with an engineer who was working on the Safari app for Apple. And one of the things that they, one of the rules that they had was fast. Had to be fast. So as they were porting the open source code, they just kept testing the pages while they were developing, the, changing the code so it could actually work as a browser, they were testing the pages, constantly going. Now, if you're doing that with a website, you're probably gonna end up with something very fast. And there is a point to that particular note that I'm gonna to get to in a second. Because our team has developed a number of tactics at this point by taking our rules, far, excuse me, focusing on um, that key emotion. So interaction, we'll start with that one. No step-by-step -step processes. Our interaction designer says, nope, we do not want, first you do this, then you do that. So make sure that you're all with me in this context. We're talking about a bunch of disciplines that are looking at how they can apply the rules to the whole system. So our interaction designer said, no step-by-step -step processes, because have you ever created a, like a bank account and been forced to do that, or set up an account where step one, step two, you're not in control. That's not powerful. That's a system telling you what to do. So our interaction designer says, no, the player should always feel in control. So we're not going to do that. We're going to find ways to work around that so that you always maintain that sense of control. This is the first application of a discipline using these rules. Player support. Player support. They often get neglected. They're the unsung heroes of what we do. Right, they're the ones who really make sure that things keep going. How can they apply it? Well, they said, you know what? We want to make sure that you are in control by always knowing that where that support ticket is. You can get support anywhere, but they want to make it really easy by making sure whether you're on mobile, whether you're on the web, whether you're in the game, you may have access to wherever it makes sense, let's say, right, to the support tickets. The community team says, you know, powerful. Right, you got to stand out. They decided they wanted to apply this by creating leaderboards on a local level. So yeah, there's only one that may rule within your small context, but maybe it's a little bit bigger if you see, hey, in my city, I'm number one, or it's smaller in my neighborhood, I'm number one, because maybe I'm not that good and I'm the only player, but that's fine. You know, get the power where you can, but that's the idea. The platform team, which is another team that might get thought of afterwards, this is not from personal experience, so I'm, I'm actually pretty cool with that, so don't get me wrong. Um, but the platform team said, you know, we help to empower other teams. And maybe we're going to make sure that the profile service, that all the information about your accomplishments, the assets, all these other things are going to be available so our teams can now bring this to life in different places. And the content team said, from the ads to the website, every bit of text it's gonna be thought of as a hero. We wanna make sure that we have thought it through so that anyone that's writing throughout the whole system can actually have those things that they need so that we, we further the empowerment, right? So you see an ad, emotional promise, so on and so forth. And it may work like this. Our team said, we're not just going to let there be an acquisition funnel, this is the path of power. This is an example of how we can look at a series of interactions, at a path, and apply our rules that are still focused on that key emotion. So the promise of power, an ad. Yeah, you're getting excited. It's telling you what the game is all about. If you go to the next step and it speaks differently, that game must be schizophrenic. No, we don't want to lose them in that. We want consistency, right? the right kind. So we are moving from an ad to the website. And the website is starting to visualize the promise. And it's fast. I was talking about page loads. I, we already know that in less, less than half a second, that thing could be judged. But if it loads up fast and you're starting to see the video, you're starting to see the visualization of the promise, man, that's going to feel good, right? It's saying, yes, I see now. I'm starting to see it, and we bring it to life. And the rest of the path can start to lead you further 
into that story that you're helping to create by being there. The fulfillment of the promise comes after, of course, we've installed the game, loaded, but there is opportunity there. Hopefully the game is great, because if we didn't get that right, the rest of it was worthless. But yes, yeah, so the fulfillment of promise is there enough, enough that you want to come back, right? It's doubtful that the first time you play a game, you're gonna be a master, it would be the easiest game in the world, and not much reason to come back without the challenge. So yes, there's fulfillment enough of that promise. And then we can create a post-game experience that allows you to regroup, reflect, and start to get excited about going again. But all of this was very conscious. We can do these things accidentally, or we can do them intentionally. An experience that's worth coming back to really has five things, five qualities, in my opinion. Authenticity, it's got a personality. You're not gonna get anywhere else. It's got something special that only those people can do, right? It's emotional. There's something that it makes you feel. It's intentional. It wasn't an accident. We don't want the things that we're creating to be accidental experiences, because if we're lucky, we won't know how we did it. And others will feel that it wasn't intentional. They'll see that, hey, it's pretty good. Right? But that's, that's nothing you want to share with your friends about. Right? Orchestrated. The whole system was focused and well-crafted right, with that intent in mind. And without a doubt, it's user-centric because the things that we make are for people. They are not for ourselves. Yes, we have a job to do. We need to do it well, but ultimately, all we're doing is making things for other people and we want them to enjoy it. So we need those five qualities. But I can't let the talk end without covering these. So we started off talking about how most people talk about user experience. They talk about usability consistency, and simplicity. They're important things. But by themselves, they don't have much value. They're shallow. There's no, there's no emotional outcome from these things by themselves, except when they have a purpose, a greater purpose. These things are more powerful when they're focused on a feeling worth repeating because they can be used towards something. Consistency, for example. There's an emotional consistency now. Right? Think of the people that you spend time with. There's an emotional consistency. That's why you spend time with them. There's something there. The products that we interact with, we don't think of as simply products when we love them, or even when we don't. Have you ever yelled at your car? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, why? Because we think of things as people. We anthropomorphize everything, and we react in the same way. This is why we get angry at products, because in those moments, we stop thinking of them as products, and we start thinking of them as humans. It's revealing what we really feel, and it isn't living up to the emotional consistency that we need and expect. So, consistency. Usability, simplicity, yes, they are important, but they're much more powerful when they're part of a whole system that's focused on a feeling worth repeating. And as one emotional creature, two other emotional creatures, thank you very much. So do you have any questions? If you have any questions, just please raise a hand and we'll come to you with the microphone. Come on, don't be shy. I'm sure everybody has a question about how to improve UX design. I do. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Wes. Thanks very much. Very good, very inspiring talk. Thank you for that. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah, so you talked a lot about how to kind of bring the emotions to the surface as what I understood, not okay. being a designer, uh, but how do you keep it? How do you keep it? Yeah. That's a really interesting question. There's, because there's a challenge of how the system 
matures. And admittedly, I don't know if I have all the answers, but I definitely have more questions. Because if, if people are going to be spending time in a space, we need to reduce the distractions that they have in the space. So as far as usability is concerned, that's actually where usability can play a very key role by making sure that on repeated use, things do feel good. And then the personality attributes can have an opportunity to really come more to the surface. I think if usability can play a role, but I think social interaction, especially in multi well, it has to be multiplayer games, um, also can do a lot. If we're making it easy for you to spend time with people that, that help you see the product in new ways, then you begin to develop a bit of an affinity for it. So I think another way of putting it is it, it can depend on the product and the circumstance. So making sure that we make it very easy to use again and again so that the product is forgotten. That may sound odd. You don't want to be conscious of focusing on it. No one thinks of, I'm having a player support experience, and I'm having this experience. No, you're just having an experience. But we want to make sure that we're out of the way so that the things that you care about are more visible. So I think it involves many things. Making sure that everything is good at one thing, for instance. Don't try to be good at everything. It's confusing. Swiss Army knife apps are not popular. And, uh, and that applies to everything. So I think being good at one thing, focusing on usability, um, allowing people to have the interactions that they want as best you can. There's a lot of things that can factor into it, uh, but it's a complicated question, admittedly, to answer. I probably would need a little bit more time to come up with a better answer. Okay, and... Hey, Wes, uh, thanks uh, for a very inspiring and uh, energizing talk. Thank you. Uh, you didn't specifically cover um, the target audience in any way. So um, <laughs> which part of this um, process actually makes sure that you are not creating groundbreakingly mind-blowing experience for nobody? Uh, make sure I understand the question. How do we make sure we're not creating mind-blowingly incredible experiences for nobody? Ooh. Got to hit me with a tough one, huh? Uh, I think it will, one of the crucial pieces is focusing on who you're doing it for and understanding them. It's, it goes back to something I touched on, which is it's very easy to create something for yourself that you think is great, but quite often what you're doing is solving a key problem or taking an opportunity and with experience design in particular, it often comes down to ad identifying what is the key problem that we need to solve. That won't be a problem for ourselves. That'll be a problem for other people. And with a game, it's interesting because it's, they're fun. So we have plenty of things that are fun. The key problem may be, well, what's fun in a new way? Where is the new value? So I think focusing on key problems, identifying um, the key value that you want to add, unlocking opportunity, and make sure that it's a complete experience. Those, those are four things that I've found are crucial for any great product. I'll go through them again. So we need to solve a key problem. We need to be a complete experience. Never release something that feels like they left out parts, like putting together a piece of IKEA furniture and realizing that Oh, yeah, it doesn't hold itself up. We don't want to do that. We need to, and I might have skipped over something, just unlock opportunity and, and add new value. So I think we need to look at something that's, that's just a copy, for one. And to be mind-blowingly incredible, whew, you're lucky if you can do that. It's, it might be mind-blowingly incredible for you, and that's a great exercise. I have been writing songs since I was 16 years old. I get excited all the time. I'm yet to hit that one that's mind-blowingly incredible. So I think if you did hit that, there's got to be someone else giving you feedback. So I think that it's, it's going to be important to, to do the things that I listed, but also get it out there. I, I think designers in general should, well, any of us, we should, we should think more like an unsigned band. Unsigned bands, they hone their music by getting exposure. 
you're going to think it's great when you're in the garage, but it's only when you're up on stage and you're playing it again and again are you going to find out how well it's really working. So get that feedback. If you've got something that's mind-blowingly incredible, um, someone else, hopefully many other people told you that. So I think you'd be lucky to have that. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I know. Okay, enough. <laughs> Anyone else? Hi, thank Hi. you for a great talk. Thank I you. enjoyed it a lot. Um, would you have any tips on taking these journey maps into use and uh, introducing them to new teams? Because it tends to be so that everyone in the team wants to input their different stuff <laughs> and they get very crowded, for example. But Yeah. So. Um, to make sure, I'm going to say the question back to make sure that I understood. So was your question around how do we introduce this to teams and do this? And are there materials for, for showing people how to do this? Yes. So, um, and any tips you have? <laughs> I, I don't have anything formal myself, but I will tell you briefly about how we've gone about doing it, let's say, for the platform team. So quite honestly, I was overwhelmed. When I started working on the team, I had an unbelievable amount of documentation to go through. Oh, there's this feature and this, this feature. There was a lot of things involved in the platform. And quite honestly, I couldn't see it. I was frustrated. So I felt, well, maybe there's value in putting together a map. And I didn't know that it would be a journey map in the beginning. I thought that might be good, but it can be a lot to develop. A uh, journey map for those who, who may or may not know, it looks very much like a map. There's a path, little dots that, that can indicate touch points. Uh, touch points could be many things. It could be a person that you interact with. A classic example that I've seen was done by Adaptive Path. I can't remember what railroad service it had to do with, but you would show a person may use a website and then um, go to the train station and blah, blah, blah. So it starts to look at all the things that they experience. And the goal is to make sure you capture everything relevant so you understand what's going on for who. And they can all be very different. But for us, we thought, well, this platform is about launching and operating games. Okay, cool. So what is that? So the way that we went about it, it was a lot of conversations. So talk to people who know. Uh, sometimes to develop a journey map, you may need to do ethnographic studies, go into the wild, talk to a bunch of different people. We had a lot of um, people that worked on the team that had done this many times. So they could almost in their sleep rattle off, you do this, you do this, you do this. These are all the things that you do. So we just used post-it notes at first. Everyone, write it out. What's something that one does? And then everyone got up on the wall and we put them in an order. Eventually, we met with other people, and we talked more about that, and we put it into a formal document. And it, it all looks very pretty, and you feel kind of proud of yourself but, uh, in that regard, but really, the more we worked at it, the more feedback that we've gotten, the richer it's gotten, the more insight that we've gained, because we're starting to ask better questions. And at this point, if you printed it out, it's like, what, 10 feet long? Something like that. It's kind of ridiculous. I took a picture next to it and showed it to my mom. She didn't care. Um, <laughs> I thought it was kind of cool. You ex designers might dig it. But ultimately, we could look at a very long experience and see a bunch of different things. But you, you can make it as rich as you want. So one very useful thing is to look for pain. If the system exists, and we did this because we, we knew there were areas we would need to improve. But if you've created, and it can just be with post-it notes. Here are the experiences. Now find a section. This is, this is how you can apply it as a team. Find a section where you say, as a team, OK, we know there's big problems here. We want to focus on that. So this is how it becomes actionable, because it's useless by itself. But then, OK, we're going to focus on that. And you can, and I've run sessions like this, have brainstorming um, activities with the group and say, how? How do we think we want to solve it? We can put together a formal document in the end to go, yes. This is what we're going to do. And if you want to learn about this, I suggest looking up, um, I think you'll find it under experience maps and MRI machines. The, the man who created the MRI machine, and I'll be brief. I know this is probably going a little long. He was very successful. That's an incredible accomplishment. 
MRI machines, groundbreaking. But he went to a clinic, a local clinic, to find out how well it was working. There's a whole video on this, it's phenomenal. And he watched a little girl being brought in, and a little girl, a little boy, and they were terrified. Have you ever had an MRI? One of those huge machines, you get in it and a pop, 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 pop. It's, imagine if you're a kid about this tall, it's absolutely frightening. He made kids scared. Not intentionally, of course, but this is what was happening with the MRI machine. So he ended up creating a journey map to start to follow the experience of these kids that were coming in. And one of the problems he was solving with that is, I believe 90% of the cases, kids had to have some sort of anesthesia. That means that they had to have an anesthesiologist on hand every time. That's expensive. And so, cutting to the end, after they followed the journey, they made it like going to camp. They would get little backpacks with some gear, all the art. If you got down on your knees and you followed it at a kid's level, all the things on the wall were exciting and fun. And then they made the MRI machine look like, uh, like a camping van or a spaceship or other things. And all of this because they saw through someone else's eyes and then they tried some things to affect a change. And it's, it's my understanding that 90% was, was pretty much gone. It might have been only 10% where they needed an anesthesiologist. But it's a great way to identify problems, to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And a journey map can incorporate anything that you find relevant, and I emphasize that. We don't want to make any of these materials because we think we should. We need to make the right things to help us communicate the right concepts. And so uh, journey maps are one way. Uh, there are others. But that's, that's hopefully some, some useful information for you. OK, thank you very much. And um, thank you.